whoa, that was loud. Well, anybody who knows me knows that I'm like super loud. So, what's up, y'all? How you doing? Welcome to the Trill NBA show with your host, the Trillist NBA. You'll ever know me, and I have multiple names, and I won't name them all, but y'all know me. <laughs> And I'm so excited today. I have in the studio Alexia. What's hey. up? What's up? <laughs> so, y'all, I'm flipping the show a bit today. Uh, we're going to flip this show a bit today because I just had a lot on my spirit, deep down in my spirit. And so, Alexia is my friend from The Shy. Okay, shout Shy out to town. Chicago. Southside. Yes, yes. And so, um, Alexia moved here, I guess it's been over a year now, huh? Just like at the year. year. Yeah. yeah. And um in her culture shock, we in between culture shock, we go to the movies. <laughs> yes. Um, because we live far, far away, as our friends tell us, <laughs> except for you about to leave. We live me. in Zimbabwe. Yes, you and me us now. Girl. We, part, we about to part. We're we gonna to park this park. week. <laughs> Thursday, I'll praise God. I'll drive down. I'll drive down there. Yes. Um, but the past two weeks, weekends, we've ended up at the movies. And so the first weekend we saw I Am Not Your Negro, which had me all in my feelings, which that was part of last week when I was, um, last week when at the end of the show and I was talking about, you know, I really just have a lot on my spirit when it comes to this, this movie. Um, it really impacted me because I'm really missing having a voice, that voice that James Baldwin gave the world, and I'm missing that. And so then this weekend, yesterday, yeah. <laughs> we went Less to see hours ago. Get Out. And I, okay, if you really know me, you know I hate scary movies because my problem is in movies, I get so involved. Like, my spirit just trans transcends somewhere, and I am in the movie with the people. I'm no longer in my seat. There are people sitting beside me. I am in the movie now. But my body is in the seat beside the people. And so what happens is, is I'm interrupting the movie for the other people <laughs> because I'm acting my scene as if I was in the movie, right? So, um, <laughs> so I don't like scary movies or what I deem scary movies. A lot of movies I say scary people look at me crazy, but what I deem a scary movie is anything that causes me not to understand what's going on. If the music gets cranked up and something's coming to bite me or jump at me or anything that makes me jump is a scary movie. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a horror movie, but this movie get out, they say it's a horror movie. Alexia, is yeah. this a horror movie? Well, I think it depends on like what your interpretation of a horror movie is. If it's, you know, around it being scary or like gothic, then no, it wasn't that. But right. what he revealed in the movie was the horror that a lot of African Americans, in particular black men, have to live through in everyday life. So when you think of it from that perspective, then yes, it was a horror movie, but it just didn't have the typical like visuals or scenes that you would see in a horror movie right and i i would say that was accurate because i you know i was nervous like i was anxious the whole time i'm walking yeah. to that i was like i'm anxious to see this because i don't know what's gonna happen and yeah. i don't like scary movies so i mean i don't know and then i was i'm like texting alexia i was like look don't judge me if i scream or uh, grab yeah, you. you jumped a couple of times at the beginning of the movie because and, i was scared. And it wasn't even like scary the scenes weren't even scary it's just again it's like you are almost anticipating. I fear. was. So. I was scared. Um, okay. I try to tell people. I I have. So I suffer with anxiety. And so like any time that like people are trying to make you anxious. Well, then that, that's what's going on with me. I'm, I'm it's just on 10. And I just that's why yeah. I, I stick to romantic comedies. And I stick to comedies. And I stick to like even action. Some action movie movies have me twisted. And I'm just you don't like, like all the, the shooting. And I mean, like, yeah, and it's like boom, boom, boom. I'm like duck. I'm like I'm ducking in the movies yeah. again. I my mind. I'm an only child. I have an a, imagination on a hundred. Yeah. So yes, knows what I'm talking about. Like I'm not alone in this. Okay. okay. Everybody try to make me crazy. But anyway, not this is not about me. What this is about today, we're changing the script. 
we're going to talk about these two movies because the juxtaposition of watching one and then watching the other was kind of crazy. And I think it's like, it gives a good, it's a good balance, right? So one movie was more historical Mm -hmm. and took a more like intellectual view of the struggles of being black in America. Right. The other one took more of the horror and like comedic side of it but they both like at the end of the day had very strong messages in it and very relevant messages um to what's happening in america today so it just kind of if you're a person who is open to diversity in terms of how stories are told then you can enjoy both of them but there's some people that are going to prefer one um one point of view over the other so it just kind of depends right it does depend and so Today, these three segments, we're, we're free-flowing. Listen, I'm going to be real. I'm going to keep it true. So normally, I'm all prepared, and I got my notes, and I send my notes to my producer early, and I, send my, and I have my guests, and I have things all laid out. Let me tell y'all, right now, I'm in the middle of planning season, and for those who are in corporate America, you know what planning season is, and you know what that means. My team presents Thursday morning, sharp, 8.30 a.m. the a.m. And so what that means is that I've been up late, up early, doing slide PowerPoints, and yeah. <laughs> so I this is in my spirit though. Yeah. And this is what I had planned to talk about. This was why we went to the movies yesterday. Um so I did do some planning, okay? So this is somewhat thought out, but what you're gonna hear are the um Unfiltered thoughts of Felicia today. That's what you're going to hear. All right. It's going to be interesting (laughs) because I'm kind of crazy. So first, let's talk about I'm Not Your Negro, Mm -hmm. which I kind of wish we could have had time to go see again. (laughs) Yeah, because I feel like you don't really get it. You can't really... You walk walk out of the movie and you're like, that was awesome. But it's obvious. It's very historical, more of like a academic intellectual approach so it's almost like you need to see it twice because you know you miss something the first time. right I, I feel like so that's unless why you, unless you took are notes. a student of james baldwin i'm not and me either so no that wasn't <laughs> what was going down um but I definitely walk out of the movie feeling the desire to be woke <laughs> yes that is exactly what happened to me like i feel like that movie changed my life. So the, the first thing I I, I want to talk about was like, this, this is the premise of the movie, right? So it is about James Baldwin was starting to write a book. Um, and I don't know the name of the book. I probably should look that up because there was a name to the book. But um, was it, was the was the book I'm not sure? No, the book didn't come out. So this was 30 pages of manuscript. And it had a name. Oh, remember this house. That was going to be the name of the book. And so basically what happened is he got to like 30 pages of it before he died. And it didn't get to finish the book. But the book was about his personal accounts with um, Malcolm X. And it's funny. I went back and I watched the show. Last time I talked about it, I said Malcolm X twice. It was Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Megger Evers. And so um, it was very interesting because this movie um which is oh my god which i love was um narrated by samuel L. jackson which to me i, I well, i've always loved samuel L. jackson in movies mm-hmm. like i will watch because i don't like many of those quentin tarantino movies because again they make me jumpy <laughs> and they're bloody <laughs> but um pulp fiction what yes i yeah and it's been a minute since i've seen it i gotta go back and watch it again but I really love Samuel L. Jackson. So for having having him narrate this, his his the tonality of his voice, the timbre and his the the tone is just perfect for what this movie was supposed to portray. It was like a perfect vehicle. So um, the director of this movie is uh, Raul Peck, and I think he did a great job. This movie won lots of awards, as it should have. Um, but. So the premise is about James Baldwin's relationship, basically, with these three men. And, you know, he is telling, James Baldwin is telling the story of the time. So in my mind, James Baldwin is a scribe, a a storyteller extraordinaire, but not just a storyteller because, 
you know, at work, I mean, I tell stories. <laughs> but for James Baldwin, I think his stories were the absolute truth. And maybe I'm biased. I will put that out there. But I feel like he was telling the absolute truth of what was really happening in the 50s and 60s through his own eyes and his own experience to black people in this country. And I don't think he was only just, I don't know if he was only talking to black people. No, he, he wasn't just talking to black people. What I'm talking saying, about the black he, was, he was telling the black experience, okay. right? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and not to say exclusively telling the black experience, because he, you know, he, he was a multifaceted human being. But he was telling, though, the mistreatment of a group of people yeah. um, in such a way that was so well thought out and so compelling right because that's the point of a story is to make your case in a compelling way where people want to listen that he was giving lectures and it shows this in the film he was giving lectures to white students at cambridge like all white audience and they are giving him a standing ovation and he is basically telling them to me it's like the best read of them all right <laughs> like he was telling them about their their culture their answer their, their foolishness the antics he was telling the truth, but in such a way that was so captivating. And I'm like, where is that voice today? Who is going to be our truth sayer? I think, well, here's the thing. Or do we have one and I'm missing it? Well, I think, I think we have several, right? I think that back then they didn't have the tools and resources that we have in, in our, that we have at our arsenal today. We have mm -hmm. social media. So true. You, any individual has an opportunity to have a voice. You know, if you think about what was happening in the 50s and 60s, protesting and marching was the only way that individuals were able to express themselves and express their resistance to what was going on. Um, but now you can still, obviously people are still protesting and marching, but they can also be very vocal through social media and talk about it. Right. Um, and so... I think there's not necessarily one voice. We're now as a community empowered to have our own voice and to be able to express it in a very, without, without control or restriction. So, mm -hmm. um, and there's obviously, you know, intellects out there who are speaking on behalf of the African American community. They're obviously, you know, who journalists. are they? Do we have, do we have names? Can we name names? I mean, can you name it? Cause I can't name a name. Like I'm like, who? Because in my mind, it's like I'm like Shonda Rhimes is a voice, and well, yeah, they people, but are they're a voice to, through media. Which, but, but I, I guess the question is like, there to me, the outlet isn't the outlet doesn't matter. You can do that. I mean, Shonda Rhimes has a platform right. in network television where she can tell stories to a very diverse audience. Because she has their attention with the storyline, the sto the overall storyline, the overall theme of the show, where she can bring in little subtle, like, mm -hmm. social issues. I mean, she's... Sometimes not so subtle. Well, not exactly. <laughs> I mean, she's taken... I mean, to her credit, she's taken on, you know, LGBT rights and marriage issues. She's taken on... She took on this election, the whole... Yes, she did. Donald, the whole Donald Trump and, you know, how hatred is how a, a candidate can fuel uh, individuals to like outwardly talk about their hatred. So, I mean, honestly, she is able, she has, she has that platform, right? Then you have people who are community organizers who are in the streets, who are, who have their voice more of the, you know, one-on-one -on -one, like connection. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have everyday people like us, like you and me, where we can talk through our social channels, we can talk through, you know, our platforms and be able to express how we're feeling about the social climate in America. So, I mean, I don't know if we, I think people arguably want to have like that Martin Luther King or that Becker Evers or that person but I think we're in a place in our in our society where we all can collectively come through. I think we you needed those you needed those national voices to be able to go on media to be able to talk to you know politicians. You don't need that anymore. If you, politicians want to know how Americans feel, go on social media. Right. You know. 
Because if the, me, the, if the media wants to know, how do you think the whole black black the reason why Black Lives Matter is the reason why it got to where it it is, and the reason why the people in media are even talking about Black Lives Matter in connection to all the police shootings that were happening is it was a movement that was started on social media, and as a result, mainstream media picked it up and started discussing it, not necessarily accurately, um, in my opinion, right. but they. You know, social media fueled a, conver- a national conversation about black men um, and black men being shot by police officers, and, and frankly, I'm not unarmed. The, the unarmed, exactly. And, and honestly, the bigger issue of the criminalization of black men in America, just in general. True. So, so w- with the criminalization of black men in America, <laughs> we're going to take our first break. We're going to come back, and we're going to talk about Get Out because that movie. I'm still unpacking. It's going to take me like three days. We're going to talk about it when we come back from the break. Okay, is this working now? I'll try. I'll try. It hasn't come up on my, my phone. Golly. Seriously? Okay, I'm going to have to Because for all intents and purposes, it's like Facebook is recording. And it's on the way, which I know that part. But I can't. Wait, was that the unedited version? Yeah. I didn't realize that. <laughs> you want to go in? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because there's some other ones that's coming. Yeah, so welcome back. We didn't know that was the unedited version. <laughs> welcome back. And that's great because we're on the internet. So that's good. We're not like Ooh. on FCC broadcast waves just yet. So. Um, but my mind is playing tricks on me. That definitely, I would say, is fitting uh, for this movie, Get Out. And so, welcome back to the Trill NBA show. I am your host, the Trillist NBA you'll ever know. And I have my friend here with me today, Alexia. Hey there. Um, she is from the Shy. One of my favorite places. South. The South Side. Side. You just get it right. Yes. Okay? And don't let all the debris I mean, fool you. Okay? I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, like... Like people from Chicago, just like the guy from the Oscars yesterday, Gary from Chicago. Like we make it known we are from Chicago. So yes, there's a lot of proud. people. Yes, and you should be. And you I, should be. It's I a great. Don't... It is the a great city. Is not the. It is not the hell that Donald Trump and all these other yeah, people want us to lead to believe. People are getting shot walking down the street every day. It is a beautiful city with some very complex issues, and nobody wants to address the issues that are actually creating the environment that the the criminal the, the criminal environment that's happening in Chicago. Like right. the reason why it's so terrible is because of the mass segregation that has happened in that city right. for years. So but nobody wants to talk about that. But that's a we're not that's not the topic right. of today. I mean it's it, it, it's fitting, right? Because what one thing I want to bring with this show is yes, I want to help people survive in corporate America. Yes, I want to talk about tips and tricks and, you know, every day as, I, as I'm as i figuring it out myself because after the day I had today, it's clear <laughs> that I need some more mentoring court and coaching too, um, which is, is absolutely fine. But, um, you know, I've learned some things along the way and, hey, those who can do and those who can't teach. So, <laughs> um, but fortunately right now I'm still doing, so that's great. Um but get out. Oh my God. So, okay, spoiler alert. If you have not seen this movie, stop listening right now because we're, we're going to talk about it. Because one thing we can talk about the themes without giving the movie. But there's, there's a specific part that I want to tell you about. Okay. Rem- remember when the guy was running in the middle of the night, like as if he was training for something? Which you're talking about at the end of the movie? Not at the end. Uh, you're talking about when he went out, went out to cigarette, right. smoke a cigarette. So, so a cigarette. Okay. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes. So one of my friends on Facebook was like, I just got that he was running track. And Jesse Owens, the reference to Jesse Owens. 
Oh, so that's why they wanted his brain. Right. Or his body. His body, right. Because they wanted to be able to... He wanted to be able beat to, Jesse Owens, basically. Yeah. That was his whole thing. And he didn't beat Jesse Owens. That's right. Because he was a track star. Right, he was a track star. Yep. Oh, my God. They, when that when she said that, I was like, holy oh, yeah. crap. I didn't, I, didn't get, I didn't get that, but now I, I see it. Yes. And so that's what he was just getting his whole entire life in this new black body. So he got it. He could control it. Well, he didn't get it. I mean, <laughs> so they tried. He tried. He tried. He tried it, but it didn't happen. But well, I mean, for for a minute, it was happening. Though, think about it, because who knows how long that had been happening before Homeboy showed up? With well, no, but you know, she started hypnotizing him with the the cup. Right, but I'm talking about the. The, the guy chopping the wood. I'm, I'm talking specifically about him. Like, who oh. knows how long he'd been there? Oh, God. Right. For years he'd been there. So, here's the... Okay. So, again, there's going to probably be some spoilers. So, if you ain't seen it, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I love you, guys. It's still... Close your ears. But you still got to see go, it. Still go see it. You still go see still it. Because we... There's still stuff I'm trying to figure out. This movie is that deep, like the way. So let me let me level set right. Let me be a good, I guess, movie writer person, which that's not what I do. But um, okay, so Cisco, right? Let me be Cisco. Let me be Ebert. We'll we'll do this black chick movie review. Okay, so <laughs> here it goes. This movie called Get Out. If you know the comedians Key and Peele, so Jordan Peele wrote and directed this movie, and if so, if you if you've seen their comedy, you understand their humor. Their their sketch comedy. They had a show. I, I think they still have a show on Comedy Central. I don't know, but I like that show. They're crazy. They do crazy things. They have some some great um, sketches about. They take everyday life things and blow them up and make them bigger than life and funny and exaggerate it. Right. So that's kind of their their comedy. So um, you also know. Uh, I think his name is Keegan Michael Key, the key part of Key and Peele. So he's the uh, Obama and the anger interpreter guy. Yeah. So that's him. Well, then this is his partner in crime, Peele, Jordan Peele. And so I, you know, I pray for that man's wife. Let me tell you why. Because for you to come up with this kind of movie, what is really going on in your head? Like, I know the crazy stuff that goes on in my head, and I question my life sometimes. But after seeing that produced out into the world, I'm like, my God, what is going on in your mind that you thought of all of this? And it was absolutely brilliant and freaky all at the same time. Like, freaky, like Freaky Friday freaky. And so... I'll just start out. So the movie is about this black dude. His name is Chris. So Chris is dating this white chick. I forgot her name because the whole time my mom was telling me her name was Becky. So yeah, yeah. I know I ain't right. I know y'all don't even have to tell me. I'm just telling y'all how I am. So it was very. It was, was it like very, Annabelle? It was or? a very American, like traditional American. Name. Right, but in my mind, she was Becky with the good hair. So this color Becky, and her so, hair wasn't that even great. It was well. That's why was, Becky with the good hair worked. Thanks, Beyonce. It's just right. It, just, it was long and it was long. stringy, but um, but yeah. So she's just this average. She's the girl next door. Right? Like the yeah. American Pie girl next door, and she comes off really super liberal. But see, here's the thing. When she told him, because she was like, I want you, it was a typical, you know, we've been dating for four months. I want you to meet my parents. We're in love. I love you. And she, I mean, as, as an actress, you got to give this girl some props because she had me confused about her the whole time. Because in my spirit, I was like, I shouldn't trust you. But then she was just real loving towards him. And I, you know, and then I try to put away my Southern biases that I grew up with that I logically know are wrong but still feel, especially about these kind of relationships. And so I was just like, okay, Felicia, so maybe she does love him, right? 
And I hadn't really read much about the movie. I'd seen the little previews or whatever. So I didn't know how this was all going down, right? So when she said, no, my dad is really liberal. He would have voted for Obama three times if, or third time if he could have. And I was like, er, Spidey senses. I was like, no, no, no. That's what, see, no, no. Those are, I feel like those are the types of comments that, to me that comment is equated to, I have black friends. Yes. It's, it's unnecessary. It's <laughs> yeah. I mean like you don't have to I think some people feel that they have to prove that they're not racist and you don't it's not it's not about you it's not about your your words mean a lot. So I'm not gonna say it's not about your words because words mean a lot, words but your mean a lot. your actions speak louder, louder. than that. So right. that whole why well, have black friends yes yeah, i have okay. hispanic friends i have asian friends no, no i no. dated this race oh, that God. race yeah oh but then, i think it, you know those those types of comments to me are unnecessary but honestly like a lot of the time they're coming from like authentically genuine places like some people yes. just don't know and i think oftentimes we especially like black people and us who are more educated sometimes we get super offended when people say stuff like that because we're very conscious and aware that right. that is very offensive mm -hmm. but i think we have to stop getting so immediately outraged, outraged and right. offended and use it as an opportunity to have a enlightening conversation with someone because if we're just if, if we just go on the defense and say right. that's a racist comment versus saying yo like that's not that that's a racist comment and i'm going to explain to you why right. And have the conversation that way, you know, the person, if the, after that, if the person still plays a fool and continues with that type of rhetoric, then that's on them. Right. But at least you had a, a teachable moment with them. And I think that's the problem with race in this country right now is people don't want to have courageous conversations about race. And we yes. need to stop, you know, expecting that people, we need to stop expecting that people are going to know better right because they're not they don't they know. weren't raised they weren't raised to know better yeah so how are they gonna how are you gonna know something that nobody ever taught you that's not fair yeah and i mean you can't and even you're like that person's 40 years old they're 50 they should know no, better and i'm no, like no not if they grew if, if 40 you know if they're 50 and 49 years of their lives they spent in the same place like, yeah and like you know thinking that certain stereotypes were okay you you, you have you can't expect them to know it. So I think right. like the we it's always easy the easy way out is for us to get a, be offended. The more difficult approach is, hey, yo, let me have a conversation with you. If right. now, if, if the person's not open to having the conversation, then, don't then spend they, your energy. They're, they're ignorant. Don't and those spend are, your those energy. are the people who at the end of the day will continue to be ignorant. Right. But as African Americans, we have to and I know we're probably like why do we? Why are we the ones who have to be responsible? Be the mature ones. Like sometimes, unfortunately, you've got to. Because if we want things, if we want things to change, and that's why Martin Luther King was so effective because he was able to have conversations. And right. we have to not allow, uh, not allow, like not being Outrage. so easily offended. I know there's a scripture in the Bible that talks about like not being easily offended, but you can't be easily offended all the time. Right. Like, just say, hey, yo, that was. It didn't in your mind you be like that's that was a dumb comment. But right. like, hey, if the person's open to it, like trying to have a conversation, let's, talk about, let's talk about it. Like the whole touching your hair in corporate America, like oh god, you have to like <laughs> you Listen, should. You have to. You, here's the bad thing though. Here's the bad I, I, thing. I, I can't even fault them because there was one of my coworkers and I went up to her and I said because I know better. I'm not gonna touch your hair, but I ain't gonna lie. Like it's some about these little curls you got going on. I just my the inner child in me wants to pull it right. and, and doing it, and I just want to go doing. But it would be wrong, and so I told her. I said, and in that moment, I realized, well, maybe that's what white people do when they want to touch my hair, especially like. <laughs> and it's been, like I've actually let this one this one woman I used to work with. She's sweet sweet woman. She's older and I had these long braids and she was like literally so fascinated by these braids. Yes. Like I've never seen anyone so fascinated. It's quite childlike. Yeah. Like <laughs> literally she was like, oh my God. Cause I don't think she's ever been that close to someone who had braids. She was right. like, how does that work? I was like, here, 
Because, I mean, right. I, I, let, I let her touch a braid because I'm like, first of all. Just get it out your system. 98% of this ain't my hair. Right. It's not even real hair. It never it came off of anyone's head. So it I was made in a factory. It was yeah, synthetic. it's real synthetic. I mean, it's burnt at the end. Right. So I'm like, people are like, oh, my God, you're touching your hair. She ain't touched my hair at all. That was right. some, thin, some, yak, some yappy, whatever right. it is. She didn't touch my hair. Um, but I didn't, I didn't take offense. I didn't take offense to that. So again, like let's, you know, let's, let's, be, let's, be, oh, let's be open to having, especially in corporate America. Like this yes. is, this is a very, this, our social climate sucks right now. Yes. It's very sensitive. <laughs> and I think you, we have to start, we, Melly Hobson talked about it. We have to be able to have these great, like these courageous conversations about race. And I think we should, you know, as as the educated African Americans, the ones who, right, the ones who are in the room, <laughs> right. the only ones in the room in a lot of these corporate settings. Right. At times, we need to be willing to have that conversation. I know it sucks. It's like why, why us? Why is it our responsibility? Well, we've, we've been chosen clearly yeah. because here's the thing: people think that they made it to where they got to be. Right? They think that oh, I did this and I did that. And let me tell you something. I've seen people work their tails off to get something and never get it. And I've seen people on the flip side just wake up. They woke up like that yeah, and privilege. got it. And it's not even about privilege. It's about, some people would say favor. But the principle is, what is for you is for you. And so stop thinking that you're in your job or you're where you're at just because you're collecting a paycheck. You are there, at least if, if if you believe in anything bigger than yourself, you are there because there's a reason and a purpose and a season for you to be there. Yeah. There is somebody's life that you're there to breathe life into. There is somebody there to breathe life into you. There is something you're there to learn. There is a reason that's bigger than you. And so if you're in your job and you encounter somebody at this moment, that is your option. To give honor to to the being that made you and put you in that place to love on somebody else. And as much as it sucks, as much as it's a burden, yeah. you to whom much is given, much is required. So you got this good cushy corporate job. Guess what, boo-boo? You're gonna have a little more required of you. Yeah, and it's just the reality. I think we have to just deal with the cards or tell. Are they the best can of cards? No, sometimes not. But then on the flip side, you know, when I go home and sit on my college type couch in my adult type house, you go <laughs> and under, I flip that that fireplace on and look at that kitchen. Are you, you know, are you go on a weekend getaway with your girls to like wherever? Are you taking out it, the like, country? Cross con- Two week cross country trip, right? You know, I'm, I was on the phone with somebody. I'm planning a trip to Ethiopia in May. Like, who yeah. really, really, Miss Victoria, Texas? Yes, that's me. Yes. Yeah, but uh, along with all those things come this responsibility that we need to focus on helping our fellow man, no matter what they look like. And yeah, I'm black. I can only talk from a black perspective. But honestly, these things, these bigger things about humanity and being human apply to everybody. They got two eyes, two ears, a nose, a mouth. And hopefully you got, like, all your other faculties below your neck. Yeah. And God willing. And I think, like, if you think, if you really go back to childhood and the innocence of childhood, kids come into this world very innocent. When they yeah. when they form, they when they form friends, they don't look at don't care. space. It's like, I wish... I wish we were not never like tormented with the realities of like race. This, this history, country. yeah. Like this. I just wish that we could be as innocent as a two or three year old, four year old. Have you ever seen four year olds play? So fun. Yeah, <laughs> they don't care. They play with everybody. Right. As long as they, you know, if anything, they may not want to. Girls are like, I don't want to play with boy or boy. Right, right, play right. Girl. Like at that age, that's where the issue, that's right? Where, like, the tension is. It's right. Between, it's like a, it's He's gender. A boy. He's icky. Right. <laughs> and then you grow up, and they're not so icky no more. <laughs> right. right. And on that note, we're gonna take a quick break, and we'll be right back with the Truly VA show. Ha, 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 ha. 
So let's get back to get out here. We, we went, went on the tangent. Yeah. <laughs> we went on a tangent. <laughs> I love it. Um, so I know. Um, yeah, I'm going to fix this. I don't know what's going on. I'm so sad. Well, it says I have two video views. So somebody's watching it. What? The um, Facebook Live. Somebody's watching it. That's good. But I don't know, because y'all still can't see it? I'm not even, I'm not on it now. Okay. Alexia, can you see it on your... with me today is my friend Alexia, my movie buddy. And today we're talking about two movies that had like a great impact on me. Um, the first movie we were talking about were, was I Am Not Your Negro. If you haven't seen that movie, please go see that movie. I know it's in limited release, but there's a number of theaters in the DFW area and in a lot of places you can see this movie. Um, so please find it, go take your kids, take your friends, take your aunties, Take grandma, take me mall, take pop hall, take, you know, just take the whole family and, and, and just be historically, you know, filled in your spirit. Um, and then this past weekend we saw this movie called Get Out. And basically this movie, um, written and directed by Jordan Peele, who's a comedian, um, this movie is basically about a black guy whose white girlfriend takes him home to meet the parents. Yeah, this movie. So I don't like scary movies. Um, I get too involved and I jump and I freak out. Alexia is my witness. Um, I do talk back to the screen. I am one of those people. I admit it. I get very involved. So, you, you know, if you go to the movies with me, 
if that bothers you, you need to tell me up front. I can try to control. I try to control myself. Like, I do. But there are times where I just get really involved. Bless you. Thank and you. so, Alexia and I went to go see this movie Sunday. And so, Alexia, tell me, what did you, when you left, when we were walking out the theater, or when the movie, the credits started rolling, like, do you remember what you thought? What was your, like, first thought after this movie? Uh, I think and I, be true about it. Be true, because I'm be true. I was like, wow. Uh, uh, it, it was, uh, I didn't know what to really think other than the fact that this is what was shown in the movie is what a lot of black men have to deal with every day. True. And I think what really just tripped me out was the whole fact that they wanted, like, the white people in the movie wanted to take the good parts of black people, like, you know, the strength, the beauty, like, those, like, more positive things that, like, we hear that other races envy about us. They wanted the good, like, they wanted that good part of us, but they didn't want to necessarily um, be black. So the way like, I, they didn't want the whole like they didn't want to the live, whole experience they didn't want to live as a black person they just wanted the good part right of us so, so the way I interpreted that is that this is this was an interpretation of white people wanting to own black bodies black slavery and Mm-hmm. that's how I took it because that, that basically that's what was happening like they were basically yeah, putting them the back ultimate the, the ultimate taking over of a person like they literally took over these people's bodies right and yeah. and parts of their and took away parts of their souls yeah but what they want look but they desired they desired certain parts of that person like True. the speed or you know just different aspects of them and it's right. just like and the fact that the, the the girlfriend at the end was looking at like future NBA players, it's like our N- NBA yeah. draft players. It's yeah, that like, was crazy. Wow. Oh, what got me was when she said, "You're the first black guy I'm taking home, baby. What am I supposed to say to that? I'm taking home a black guy." And I was just like, "Yeah, that's weird." And I was just like, "Okay, clearly you are not the first black guy she's taking home. I'm sorry. I don't believe that. I yeah. never believed that from the." Again, and, and then when he when he went to that closet and found all, all the pictures, pictures, and I was like, uh huh, see, <laughs> she even had a girl. I was like, yeah, oh. I was like, what the heck? Like, wow, she you talk about clickbait. <laughs> yeah, but it's just so in- interesting how like they envy certain parts of like the black experience, and it's like I want to, but then they still try to. So, so they still bel- they like belittle like. Being black, but like the 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 powerful or like more superior like aspects of the black life. So here's here's what got me. So the brother they got kidnapped, you know, and then because I don't want to, I'm trying to give it all away, but yeah, brother got kidnapped, and then he shows up with, with his white wife, right? Like older, like she's old enough to be, which I'm assuming she became her, like he, right, right, he right, 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 took over the husband, right, right, right. But the thing is, it's like, I mean, he's he spoke differently, he dressed differently. It was, it was like. I think what it was show, what what I think one of the one of the many things that you can interpret from from the interaction he had at the party because remember he was like he turned to his wife and he said something about like he's oh well Chris is comfortable that I'm here in his presence <laughs> that I'm like him and then I was like that is the weirdest thing ever oh. like who even if you were any race, why would you say that like that? It was so weird until, you know, further in the movie. Then I started understanding why he said that, right? But I was just so confused in that moment. And I remember I was like, wait a minute. Like, so is he not black anymore? Yeah. So at first I was like, are they, like, taking black people but then trying to make them not black because the the essence of our how we represent culturally makes them uncomfortable? Is that what 
Jordan Pill is trying to say? Because sometimes, like, I think about how I am, right? Like, so first of all, forget race. Like, forget I'm a black woman and I'm a big black woman. Like, forget all that. If I was a white, if I was a little tiny, petite, white girl, blonde hair, cute at work, how would I be perceived if I still had my same personality? That's what I ask myself all the time. Like, how would I, how, how would people perceive me? Would they still be afraid of me? Because I, sometimes I feel like there are people who look like I, because my voice carries, I talk loud. I try not to, I'm from the country, y'all. I can't help it. I really work on it. I, I'm aware. I'm self-aware. But like, I wonder if I looked different, but still had my big boisterous personality and I was all loud and happy-go-lucky and grinning all the time and however I show up. If I still showed up like that, but I was in a different package, would people still be like taken aback or afraid of me, or would I still rub them the wrong way? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Maybe. Oh. I just think, like you know, obviously. It addressed a lot of issues. I thought what was really interesting was that the guy, Chris, he was actually targeted by that woman to be transformed into the the guy who owned the art gallery. Well, well, they auctioned on that. It was crazy. Yeah, but he, I think, I think he was, I think he was targeted because remember, Chris, some of Chris's photography. Oh, he was targeted. No, yeah, you're right. He was targeted. He was targeted. So it's like, it kind of speaks to... They still want to be a... The segment of... Well, I think it's... I think there are some white women who specifically target black men because... Oh, yeah. For their attributes. Exactly. But Mm. I don't think all interracial couples are like that. I I know plenty of interracial couples that... Like genuinely, like that's that's who their helpmate is. That's who the that 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 person who it, it just makes sense for them. That's who they're with. Right. No, I I and, actually have some really good friends from business school. Um, one of my classmates in business school, he's married to a white woman, and I I listen. They met on a mission trip, and they are definitely like. They are, they're in love. They they have a baby now. Like I like to me, it was just so everything about their relationship seems like God sent. So yeah. like, I'm not I'm not. Listen, you love who you love. Like yeah. I don't like who who are we to tell people who to love? We we like sit down, be quiet. It's yeah. your business, really. But I think it's so interesting because if you think about the movie, when we went to the movie yesterday, it was probably like half and half from like a racial breakdown makeup. Like it was about half African American, half Caucasian in the movie. Right. And I wonder if, I wish we would have had an opportunity to talk to maybe one or two African Americans after they left the movie versus right. maybe one or two Caucasians after they left the movie and to understand, and get from them what they got from, understand what they got from the movie. Because I think right. it would be completely, it would be on two different spectrums, right? Right. Like, I think if you talk to an African American, they would say it really just speaks to the everyday experience of, of African Americans, right? Right. Versus, like, someone who is not African American will just think it was maybe a, a funny movie. They, they, didn't, they may not have gotten some of the messages. I think it's. Well, heck, I'm still trying to get all the messages. Like, I'm still trying to unpack this movie because I feel like there was a, a lot to be said, especially. Um, dang, I don't want to give all away. But at the end, my homeboy shot himself. And yeah. it's like, wow. Like, that, to, I'm still trying to unwrap that, right? Because what, it's like, flash of light, and so then he came back to himself, and then he killed himself? Or did he kill himself? Or did the other person kill himself? I'm I'm still processing that, because that, that blew my mind. Yeah, I'm making me speak, speak to self-hate, too. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. But, or I is it just you didn't want to be in this slavery anymore? It was his way of escape. Yeah. Well, I mean, but that's the thing. Like, well, they they kind of had two personalities because, like, you initially saw the the woman 
running and as if she wanted to like, hey, take me with you. And then in the moment when she woke up in consciousness, she looked over at Chris and was like, you right. horrible person. Right. And, and they ended up <laughs> crashing, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I think they're probably, it's, it's so I mean, it was it, like it, this it, internal battle. Yeah, but I think, but I think if you think about like African Americans every day, probably have we probably we deal with internal battles, right? Yes, we do. Let's Especially talk about in corporate that. America. <laughs> yes, let's talk about internal battles. <laughs> I have them. Do you have them? We have them. Yeah, I think we we all we all, <laughs> we all have them, right? And so it's like it's that struggle of are you. And I have, I have this conversation with friends all the time. Um, are you who you are? Like, are you your authentic self when you go to work every day? I want to be. Yeah. I want to be real bad, but I'm afraid I would scare my coworkers. That's real talk. Like, yeah. I'm, and I've mentioned this. I've mentioned this at work because we, we've talked about courageous conversations at work. And I'm like, I'm Felicia on a one. Because Felicia on a five would scare the bejesus out of you people. And I don't think y'all can handle it. And I, I, I honestly think that a lot of people of other races don't realize the internal struggle that African Americans face every day when they when they go to work because we often feel that we can't truly authentically bring ourselves to work right. because there is a certain culture that is embraced and accepted in corporate America right. and it's very counter to our natural way to present. Yeah, it's it it it, it just is like and. You, the people who are successful in corporate America, that are African Americans, either, either either a find a company that embraces like their often who they authentically are and allow right. them to be that, right? Or two, they're people who realize that they have to that they have to have a multifaceted they have to live a multifaceted life, so they have to be one way at work and play that game and then be some something else. Mm-hmm. I think the struggle comes in in the moments where things like the election of Donald Trump or like some of these when police shootings like the next work. morning you have to go to work and you can't you have to be that that more like subdued version of yourself it's subdued, diff- that's a good word. it's a it's very difficult to live in that reality when the night before there was a you know the, the news the news coverage was filled with you know an a 13-year-old African-American boy that was unarmed that was shot by a police officer. Right. Um, and I mean, I, I talk about, I, I had a conversation with um, the VP of my department who is, um, is an African-American woman, and she's been, she, she and I are able to have some really, you know, mm-hmm. direct conversations about, about race in America. And I, I told her the day after the Dallas police shootings, how I came into the office and everyone was just kind of like, oh my God, like so horrible. These police officers right. were shot and oh, right. it's hor- these, these are the people who serve and protect us every day, which I'm a, I'm very supportive, supportive of, of the police. So I right. absolutely do believe <laughs> yes. that they are, that that is the job they do. And I think that there's way more good officers than bad officers. Um, however, like that morning when I walked into the office, I was so pissed because at that moment, racism won in, in, in America. Yeah. And it was our, the racism that exists in this country was put on display. Right. And the way that the story was turned mm-hmm. was around, we need to support police officers. And like one of my coworkers was just like, oh my God, it's the worst thing in the world. And I looked at him and I was like, it's also horrible when black men, unarmed black men are shot by the police as right. well. It's all so horrible. I'm like, we have to, like, we can't necessarily like have a one dimensional view. Like, when a life is taken from this country, from from this earth by gun violence, it doesn't matter if it was a police officer or if it was an innocent black man. We should be pissed that we should be pissed as a society that there's one less person in this country who will be able to contribute to our world. Right. And so I was frustrated because a racism one, two, it's a the perception of that situation was very limited, and then three that. As a country, we don't have shared outrage when innocent people, regardless of their race, right. are killed. Right. So, listen, I'm actually going to do part two because I want to come back next week and touch on this idea that, you know, I think I think something James Baldwin was talking about was this whole white people live a, a life in public and a life at home. So it made me start thinking about, like, 
do they, are we as human beings going through the same thing, but just differently? And I want to try to connect those dots next week and how that affects us in corporate America and in our personal life. So we're going to come back next week with this uh, same topic. Uh, hopefully, maybe Alexi can come back. I don't know. I didn't ask. I just thought about this. I can't do it last week, girl. But, but, I got you. but we're going to do part two. And thank you guys for listening to the Trill NBA show. We're out. The other thing I wanted to talk about was that when James Bond was talking about how, you know, white people have lived, they, in the tele, how television affects the, their perception of what a good life should be, and that that's not the reality, and they live this duality. And I was like, well, if you juxtapose that against the duality, the duality that we live um, as black people in this country and corporate America is very similar. So I was like, Talk about it. <laughs> you like that? Thank you for listening to the Trill NBA show. Follow us on Twitter at Trill NBA and visit our website, TrillNBA.com. The Trill NBA show is a Fair World Corp production, executive produced by Felicia and Rose. Keep it trill every day, y'all. 